Hello, it's Tim again, um, back for some more video lectures for critical reasoning. Uh, this is the first video in a series of videos on uh, inductive arguments. Um, and there's a lot of material here, so get ready. This module is going to be a big one. And um, I, I already kind of made an announcement with the advice that, <coughs> pardon me, with the advice that uh, you kind of watch these videos as we go. So hopefully you're catching this one early. And um, you can keep your eye out uh, for the new videos as I'm recording them and, and posting them. So um, I will be continuing to do that as quickly as I can. I'm gonna, I might even record two today because I, I want to get things loaded up so that you can start thinking about this stuff. But there's a lot of material in this section. Um, if you remember way back when I was explaining the structure of the whole quarter, I talked about this second unit as uh, the unit when we start getting into of actually evaluating arguments to figure out if they're good or bad. But way back from the beginning I've also talked about there really being just two standards for what it takes to have a good argument. Having all true premises, your premises, your evidence has to be actually true. That's a Testing that's a dilemma for the philosophical field of epistemology which is all about study of knowledge. Um, but the second standard is something that is the province of logic. Um, and that's this standard about having a good support relation. But back when I talked about what it means for the argument to have a good support relation, um, there was some ambiguity here because we have two different standards that we use for evaluating the support relation of arguments. One of them is validity. And the last module, um, formal evaluations of arguments, is all about testing the standard of validity as a way of figuring out if an argument has a good support relation. But so many of the arguments that we make just don't square with the standard of validity. They're not able to, they're the kinds of arguments that don't give a, a perfect proof for the conclusion, but rather just give us like good reason to think that the conclusion is true, or that makes the conclusion more probable or more likely to be true, but doesn't give a 100% proof. There's very few things you can give a 100% proof for in this world. Um, but there's a whole realm of reasoning that covers all the rest of that stuff. I mean, it's not like just because you can't give a complete proof for it, uh, there's no rationality involved in deciding what to believe. Um, in fact, all of science is in this special category. And I know that sometimes we can have this feeling about science like it's got this um, infallibility to it or that it is providing a proof, but it doesn't. It doesn't almost ever provide absolute proof, but it can give us really strong reasons to believe something and um, and that's what we're gonna kinda get it we'll all talk about science a lot in this unit um, because this is the unit that's devoted to this other realm um, the other standard that we use to evaluate an argument support relation that's not deductive validity and that's a, a standard we refer to as inductive strength so strength is going to be the the issue now how strong is the inference that's being made. It may not be a valid argument, the premises might not provide a total guarantee for the conclusion, but they're also not enough offering nothing, they're offering something, that something is strength. And that's what we're going to be trying to measure. But right out of the gates here, um, talk about inductive strength is uh, a pesky notion. Um, like uh, the informal pr um, principle I kind of gave you before to describe our definition of strength was that uh, arguments are strong if the premises give you good reason to think the conclusion is true. And you might be wondering, uh, what are the standards for a good reason? That seems pretty empty. And that's right. I mean, it is. <laughs> if that was the only answer, it would be very empty. But we can cash that out. We can talk about um, in what way inductive reasoning uh, gives us good reason and how we can actually measure that. But, but like I said, right out of the gates, this is a totally different game from logic. Back with logic, so evaluating the support relation of an argument using deductive validity, validity was an on-off property. An argument either was valid or it wasn't valid. And there was no in-between. You can't have an argument that's sort of valid. Because validity, if we think back to the technical definition of it, an argument is valid if it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false at the same time. Something can't be sort of impossible. That's not, there isn't really such a thing. I mean, you, to speak that way is to do violence against the meaning of impossible itself. So we can't do that. Um, but we have something else to talk about, strength. And strength is, instead of being an on-off property, is actually something that's on a continuum. It's a, it's a gradual continuum. 
arguments could be stronger or weaker. I mean, there's no absolute um, sort of metric here, and there's no way I could give you some kind of quantifiable unit of strength. There's nothing like that. However, what we can do, even though it might seem like a little fuzzy and subjective, again, we're back to the fuzzy, fuzzy town. I'm, I'm sure you've missed it <laughs> with logic, um, but we're back. This is going to be full-on fuzziness. Judgment calls galore, so get ready. And background assumptions. We're going to talk about all of those three things uh, quite a bit in this unit. Um, but sorry, I lost track of my thought a little bit. Um, so even if we can't give some kind of um, discrete units of strength, like there's no units here like pounds or feet or something like that. Um, but what we can do is we can identify those uh, theoretical principles and standards, a sort of criteria that would make an argument stronger or weaker. So we can figure out what strength depends on, even if it's hard to sort of pin down exactly how strong it is. We can definitely identify what are the things that would contribute to a stronger versus a weaker argument. Um, and I think you'll find that, uh, at least with some of these examples, when you're evaluating them, uh, a lot of the examples from the book or that you're going to encounter on the homework and on the exam too, are going to be a little more clear cut. It's not going to be really in that super gray area. It's sort of like, with regard to the particular standards, it's doing a pretty good job or it's kind of doing a really bad job. So. Uh, they'll be the the examples are chosen a little more extremely, but in the real world it's tougher. It really is tougher. Um, some cases are more clear cut than others, but so even if we can't get a ton of precision here on um, on exactly how strong an argument is, we can definitely get straight on what are the things that will affect it, and that's the most of the material that I'm going to be teaching you. Um, in fact, uh, this is skipping ahead a little bit, but when it comes to the exam problems, a lot of the exam problems I'll be giving you a type of argument and you'll have to be using a certain criteria to evaluate its strength. Um, and I will be less interested in whether you say the argument is strong or weak compared with a certain criteria as much as the way that you explain your judgment call. Almost all of the partial credit will be based on that. Um, I Again, I've tried to make some cases that are a little more clear-cut and those ones are a little more clear-cut and so you know if you say it's weak when it's actually really strong you know there'll be a problem there, but I'm going to be reading your answers on the exam very carefully to try to see that if your explanation shows me that you understand at least what's the principle. Because, um, like I mentioned background assumptions a second ago, because all of these evaluations are going to depend a lot on background assumptions, and I can't count on you having the same background assumptions I do, we may come up with different answers to how we would evaluate an argument, and that's okay because uh, we can have a debate about this stuff. There can be reasonable disagreement between people, but we can still make sure that we're on the same page as far as the criteria that we're using to evaluate that argument. Okay, so what are the what are the theoretical requirements of an argument of a certain type? How are we what are the facets we'll be looking at of that argument to determine whether it is strong or weak? We might make a particular judgment call based on things we know about the world and how we have different worldviews, but those theoretical standards, those theoretical criteria um, are universal. So uh, we'll be talking about that um, and breaking down each of these arguments. This is going to be also different from validity from the logic section in as much as validity is validity across the board. It doesn't matter what logical form an argument was in, the standard of validity was the same every time and testing it was the same every time. With inductive reasoning, there's a lot of different forms of inductive arguments and each form of an argument has its own set of criteria for how to evaluate it. Which means, and actually here, let's let's get let's dig into my lecture notes a little bit. Um, we're going to be covering uh, these sort of uh, four different categories of inductive arguments: statistical generalizations and applications. That's one thing. Uh, causal arguments. That's another one. Uh, inference: the best explanation, which is actually one of my favorite things to talk about. This is an argument style that uh, we don't usually think about explicitly, but we're actually using all the time. Um, and argument from analogy. So each of these, here I'll kind of, I'll scroll down in here. Each of these has its own section in my lecture notes here. Uh, I give you a definition, I give you some examples, and then these bolded sections are, um, are the criteria that we use to uh, evaluate that type of argument. So you'll notice statistical generalization here has a different set of standards than 
um, statistical generalizations. So they each they have different sets of standards. Some have more, some have less. Um, causal reasoning will be its own kind of strange game that we'll talk about when it gets to it. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Beep, beep, beep. And then here's inference the best explanation. This one has a lot of different criteria. There's seven different factors here. And then uh, arguments from analogy, same sort of thing, a, a bunch of different standards. So um, that's already going to make things more complicated. Like I said, there's a lot of stuff for us to talk through um, uh, in this unit. Uh, so stay with me. Um, I will be giving proportionate credit based on how many hours of video I make you watch. So I will be rewarding you um, in your grade for listening to more lectures. But there's this is a this is a unit that'll take some more time to get through. I really strongly suggest that you don't procrastinate on this unit and that you do a little bit throughout the um, the two weeks that I've recommended to, to finishing it up. Okay, so um, I think that's all the preliminary stuff I want to talk about. Um, yeah, I think we're ready to dive into it. So let's take a look here. All right, so first off here, we've got statistical generalizations and applications. And let's talk about generalizations first. Um, so uh, I'm actually going to draw some pictures here in a sec. Well, actually, let's look at the definition first. So um, if you've ever taken a stats class, um, I, I, uh, had a, I've had some very interesting conversations with statistics professors in the past. Um, back when I was an undergrad, there was a stats professor at my college who wanted to teach a class. I went and listened to a lecture that was like a proposal for a class, but he wanted to do something called Everything Causes Cancer to talk about how statistical manipulation can occur. Um, and very often when we are given an argument that relies on statistics, um, we find it uh, just kind of compelling on the grounds that it has statistics, unfortunately. There's a kind of uh, rhetorical cash value in just the fact that there's some numbers that are maybe given with a lot of precision, like blah, 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 point, blah, 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 sort of thing, or you know, percentages and stuff like that. We're impressed by that. We're impressed by that kind of precision. But the question is always accuracy and whether the statistic that's being offered is actually relevant if we're reasoning about that statistic in the right sort of way. Relevance issues are going to come up there. So uh, th we're going to be talking about the kinds of arguments that you would learn about in a stats class just minus the math. We're not going to talk about the math at all. Instead, we're going to be talking about the rational principles that are involved here. So uh, first, let's just talk about what is a statistical generalization. So a statistical generalization, I have listed here the definition. It's an argument that makes a claim about a reference class by citing claims about a sample of that class. Um, now, you might be wondering, like, what are we talking about when we're talking about um, samples and reference classes and that's where I'm going to draw some pictures to help but here's an example an example case critical reasoning is a boring philosophy class therefore all philosophy classes are boring so there's a there's a sort of category that we're talking about philosophy classes and critical reasoning is in that category and it is boring and so a generalization says, because something that was in that category has this property, therefore everything in that category has that property. Um, and actually, if this strikes you, uh, if, if statistical generalizations um, strike you as maybe initially problematic, because they bear a striking resemblance to something we refer to as stereotypes, then you're not uh, off the mark. Um, this is actually something I... Man, usually when I teach this class in person, I spend a whole class period, like 50 minutes, uh, kind of talking about uh, stereotypes and bigotry in general and, and sort of um, uh, these sort of patterns of thinking and reasoning that we consider to be incredibly problematic, They're, that are at the root of prejudice um, and things of that nature. And um, I think I am going to get on this tangent a little bit with this online class, even though it's going to take some time. I think it's worth it. Um, at the very least, I'm going to want to make a case to you that um, statistical generalizations are not ethically problematic all on their own. I actually uh, kind of used to think that when I was a young philosophy major um, and I was doing goofy stuff all the time and being a little uh, activist-y. I, I like to make these weird pins, these provocative pins that I would wear at my job at a sandwich shop and uh, try to instigate philosophical discussions with people or just kind of poke them and get, get us talking. 
Um, and I, want, I once said, um, uh, made a claim about generalization basically creating racists. Um, and I, and there is there is a reason for there to be a guilt by association here. But now, actually, I want to make an argument to you that it isn't statistical generalizations that are the problem. It's a bunch of other things that I would put the attention onto that are the sort of problematic areas of reasoning. That, I mean, statistical generalizations, if we didn't have them, you wouldn't be able to do just about anything in terms of reasoning about the world and getting around in the world. Um, science wouldn't be capable of doing what it does without this form of inductive reasoning. Um, science is always talking about natural laws. It's trying to talk about universal principles, about how things work. And how do they try to determine what those are? From a bunch of discrete cases, specific experiments that have been made um, that just show a large regularity of a pattern. Um, that's making a statistical generalization. Without it, we couldn't do science. And um, and I don't think that's an argument all on its own, like we need this reasoning because without it we don't get science. I mean, it could still be unethical, and potentially, certainly science has run afoul of ethical issues with how it conducts its research um, and the reasoning that can go on with it. But in this case, I think uh, I think there's a defense that can be made, and I'd love to have the opportunity to give that to you, um, to give you those arguments and you can see uh, what's going on here. I think I think sometimes we jump the gun a little bit on, our, on, on where we place blame. Um, and I don't think it's I don't think it's the reasoning form of statistical generalizations that's problematic, but other things that are what make um, prejudice and bigotry so wrong and um, and offensive. So uh, we'll may, we'll take that tangent at some point. Maybe maybe after we kind of go over statistical generalizations in the material, because of course I'm not going to put something on the exam about prejudice and bigotry that you'll have, not like some random essay question you'll have to answer. Um, I'll just be testing you on the kind of understanding of the analytic form of statistical generalizations and how to evaluate them. Okay, so uh, I promised some drawing. Let's do some drawing. So I can diagram for you how a statistical generalization works like this. So we're talking here about statistical generalizations. These are going to be different from statistical applications, but First, let's just do the statistical generalizations. And I'm going to do this. This will look kind of like the book. And then we'll do this. And then I want to make a couple lines here. All right, now let's fill in the bubbles here. So each of these bubbles is a category of subjects, things that we're talking about. And these little lines I'm uh, drawing are to refer to what I like to just call uh, property X. Property X. So that's the same thing over here. Yeah. Property X. And this is a predicate. Remember, we, we've talked about claims before, like making full claims um, before in this class. Uh, to have a full claim, you need a subject and a predicate. If we look back to our example here, Critical reasoning is the subject, and what are they saying about it? It's boring. And there's actually a little extra information we get here. It's boring, and it's in the category of being a philosophy class. So um, critical reasoning would actually show up here. The property that it has is being boring, and it's in this larger category of philosophy classes. And then you'll notice the conclusion says all philosophy classes are boring. So the subject here is all philosophy classes, and the predicate is being boring. So that's what we've got going on here, the category of philosophy classes, and they have this property X. So this category is the reference class, this bigger category, and the smaller one is the one that we call the sample class. So in a statistical generalization, I am making an inference from the fact that the sample has a certain property that the reference class then has that property. So I like to put a little, oh come on, there we go, a little therefore symbol. Okay, So we're, we're making a claim that the sample class has a certain property and from that claim we're generalizing to say the reference class has that property too. So if I, if I was trying to figure out what, you know, what's going on with the reference class, um, what's happening with this reference class? I'm not sure. You know, maybe I've got some questions about this. 
I'm so confused. Questions abound. What does the reference class have property X or not? One way I might try to investigate that is to look at some of the members of the reference class and see what's happening with them. Uh, we're actually, uh, you know, it's, I'm recording this on Tuesday on election day, so this is a perfect day to talk about uh, uh, statistical generalizations because when uh, we're making polls, like people have been trying to predict what's going to happen in the election, and so they conduct polls exit polls from from where the all the before all the votes have been counted they can sort of get an idea of what's going on um, by looking at some of them or when you just you know when um, Gallup or whoever is like uh, doing a poll of people of Americans generally we want to figure out what do Americans think about some issue um, an example I like to use here is uh, I, because I get to make a joke about it later <laughs> is let's look at this example of um, let's say what do all Americans think about gun control Okay, so we want to know what sort of, let's get a lay of the land here. So going back to my picture, um, we could say the question here is we're wondering about um, Americans. We're wondering what they think about, about gun control. So if we were to, I'm going to erase all these things. You know, we still got questions about what's going on with the reference class. So what are we going to do? We're going to poll some people. So the sample would be the people we polled. And we see the results of that to say, well, maybe, I don't know. Um, I'm just pulling a number out, out or whatever. I mean, I, you, I don't, don't make me think there's some like gun control bias thing going on with me. But let's just say this is just an example, just an illustration. Let's say, I don't know, 60%. Um, approve of some form of gun control something like that I don't know I don't even know if that's anywhere close to accurate I could look it up on Wikipedia probably right now but it doesn't matter because we're just making an illustration here um, so of the people we pulled you know what's what's true of the people that we pulled what describes this category well what describes them is that 60 percent of them approve of some form of gun control there we go so then we think Okay, well, if that's what happened among the people that we polled, then that must mean, you know, the same thing over here. That Americans, what's true of Americans, 60% of them approve of some sort of gun control. There we go. That's the kind of way in which a statistical generalization works. If you got some question about what's happening with a category, investigate part of that category. This is a really, really basic way that we reason about things. Um, let's say I'm not sure whether I'm going to like caviar. What do I do? I try it. And then I find out. And I generalize from the one experience I had of one particular batch of caviar, what do I think about caviar generally? Right? That's a, that's a kind of um, statistical generalization that, that we make all the time. I mean, this is a basic form of reasoning that we're using constantly. And we can mess it up. We can definitely do this badly. Oftentimes, uh, looking at one case is not sufficient. That's one of the standards we're going to talk about in a second for what makes it for a better statistical generalization versus a worse statistical generalization. But that, um, that this is something that's a basic part of how we live. That if you're like, well, if you want to find out about something, a category of happenings that are going on in the world, you have to actually take a look at them. It's investigated. We're going to sample them. We're going to run some experiments. We're going to find out. Okay? But to do that, that requires us to generalize. We're going to have to take only the bits of experience that we've had contact with to try to learn about things that we don't necessarily have had contact with. But we think we can do this. Um, another example would be uh, of a statistical generalization would be a kid who puts her hand on a hot stove. Do you want, you're, you're like, mm, i got to be more rigorous with this. Let me turn it up to a higher heat and then we'll see what happens. Oh, let's do it again. I mean, maybe that was just an accident. Better, better have some consistency here with our experiments. We better make sure it's repeatable. Let me try it out at my friend's stove or my grandmother's stove. The kid doesn't need to do this. Once is enough. Once is all it takes, and probably all that we reasonably need, okay, in order to make the judgment uh, in this case. But in other cases, it's different. Not all cases are alike, and this is where um, background assumptions are always going to be playing a role in inductive reasoning, but but more on that later. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but um, hopefully you understand at this point how uh, statistical generalizations work um, and what's their basic form. 
So actually, I want to roll back the clock here a little bit. Let's go back. Okay, so here's where we were uh, with just the formal elements. I'm going to start um, giving you some standards. I want to pick a good color here, uh, a color that is legible. Let's do let's do green. Let's see if this works. Criteria. Oh yeah, that's great. Okay, so we'll use green. <clears throat> As we go through the different uh, standards for evaluating a statistical generalization, I can draw them into the map here as like a helpful reminder of what we need to be looking for. And this is this is something I'm going to do with all the uh, inductive argument patterns. Um, and I like to I've sort of over the years of teaching this class, I've learned about a a little mantra that I think is a good advice for students when they head into this module. Um, the difficulty here is learning when you're when you're trying to evaluate these types of arguments by using their criteria. Uh, it kind of touches back on a sentiment I've shared many times in this class, which is that there's a difference between understanding an idea intellectually and then being able to apply it to actually like wield it uh, in an active analysis and to get a certain result. And definitely, I would say that if my in principle explanations of these concepts in the video lecture make sense don't think you have mastery yet. Try to get at some homework problems as soon as you can to see where you actually are with it. And I, my, guess, my guess is that you'll probably run into some, bound, some um, barriers. You'll run into some, some challenges here in figuring out how to apply those principles or what you're, and this is the phrase that I've, I've learned. What are you supposed to be looking for and where are you supposed to go looking for it? A big part of what I'm going to be looking at when I'm grading your explanations on the exam problems and trying to determine partial credit is just, is the student's explanation letting me know that they know what they're supposed to be looking for with this criteria and how to go about making that evaluation. And there are these different um, aspects to the structure of these arguments and some of the standards are looking in some places rather than others. Um, and uh, with a with a statistical generalization, there is kind of a story to how this happens um, that we can use to, as a framework for helping you get some get some kind of intuitive grasp on how to actually evaluate these arguments using these principles. So I'm going to talk you through that as we go. And actually, there's a um, the idea of like pulling people. That's an example I'm going to use a lot. But I'm actually also going to I want to use um, an example uh, that a student gave me one time because polls are polls are really simple and they don't uh, I mean there's some complications like the book describes ways in which polling can go wrong and there's absolutely ways in which polling can go wrong um, but there's also a lot of uh, other stickier cases where some of these standards are going to come more to the forefront or you're going to see how it could be potentially problematic uh, or how its statisticalization could go wrong not all cases are the same in inductive reasoning they all have their own kind of idiosyncrasies with them um, but so here's the other example. I, I asked students one time because a really good example of statistical generalization is the kind of research you have to do in say um, if you're doing a kind of sociological investigation of, of the world. And uh, I asked a student one, I, I asked my students one time for like, well, what's an example? How many of you have taken a sociology class and you know people raise their hand and and you know, in a lot of those classes, you have to do a project where you have to actually conduct an investigation. You have to collect some research to, to make a, a conclusion about what's going on, make some observations, and then draw some conclusions off of that. Um, and oftentimes, you have to do that through a survey. So you have something you want to investigate. But oftentimes, you can't ask people about it directly. You've got to be kind of sneaky with your survey and how you ask the questions in order to figure this out. And, so the various steps that are involved in doing a project like that for a sociology class or any kind of, if you're doing any kind of survey, um, is a great example for walking through these different uh, criteria for evaluating uh, statistical generalizations. So um, I asked students for, for an example one time, and I'm going to kind of change this uh, one that the, this example a student gave me just to make it a little easier for us to work on, a little more straightforward, because uh, they had a really complicated thesis that they were investigating. but to kind of boil it down a little simply. They said they're interested in understanding um, deviant sexual behavior and Bellevue College students. So let's boil this down. I mean, they had a more complicated thing going on here, but let's boil it down to just like, let's say we want to figure out like what percentage of Bellevue College students engage in sexually deviant behavior. And deviant here, not in the sense of like prejudging that it's wrong, it's just 
nonconformist, like and like not not the not the um, general norms of behavior that exist in our society. So they're like, how many people like don't fit that model or have a sexual lifestyle that goes outside of the um, sort of general norms in our society when it comes to sexual behavior? But you can't really just go up to people and be like, "So are you a sexual deviant?" That's that's not, uh, and they may not. They may have a different standard for how we're determining what those norms are and what they consider to be deviant and stuff like that. So, um, the the student had to be a little more careful in how they designed a survey to get the kind of data that was really going to help them get an idea about what was going on with their reference class. So let's uh, let's kind of think about this in the context of our model. The reference class in this case was Bellevue College students. The sample class would be the students that they had take their survey, and property X would be, um, you know, what percentage is a sexual deviant. And I've run a couple examples here now where the the property X was a percentage, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. It could be it doesn't have to involve a percentage at all. It might be about all. Like in the first example, like all philosophy classes are boring. Not a percentage, but just all of them. So. Um, it might be that everyone we survey is a sexual deviant. So then, the, then you generalize to say all Bellevue College students are sexual deviants. But so the percentages may or may not be relevant for statistical generalization. So don't think that that's a necessary component. Okay. Not all statistics are 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 proportional. Okay. So uh, if we were going to try to figure out what were the factors that would make this generalization stronger or weaker. If our, if our students trying to be careful in how they're going to draw conclusions based on the sociological investigation that they're doing, there's a few factors that they would need to keep in mind. Um, and those are listed here from the book, and I, I have sort of summarized them and put some bullet points on here. Uh, this first one I'm actually going to say, ignore. Don't worry about this. Should we accept the premises? Are the premises true and justified? Again, this is a standard we care about for every argument. Every argument needs to have a good support relation and have all true premises. If that's failing, bad argument. It doesn't matter how good of a support relation. But we're not going to get into that in this class. We're not going to get into how we, whether we know certain particular facts are true or false or whatever. Um, we're going to be focusing on the reasoning part, whether there's a strong support relation or a weak support relation when we're talking about inductive arguments. So that's all of our focus. So that means I'm not going to ask you about this on the exam. Uh, this is not something I want you really worrying about. The first standard that we should start to be thinking about is, is the sample size large enough? And the general principle here is that the bigger, the better. So um, standard number one is um, sample size. All right, that's the first thing that we might be concerned about in evaluating a um, a statistical generalization. What's the sample size? If the sample size is really small, that gives you less evidence from which to make the statistical generalization. If I'm, uh, if I'm trying to figure out about these Bellevue College students and what's going on with their sexual behavior, and I only talk to two people, that's not an adequate enough sample size. That's clearly inadequate. If, um, if I'm a student conducting the survey, though, there's thousands of students at Bellevue College. Let's say I talk to 1,000 of them. If I, if I manage to get 1,000 survey responses, that's pretty good. I mean, that's really good um, in terms of having a statistically significant sample. Where exactly is that line drawn of what's good enough and what's not good enough? That's going to be really difficult. And there's a whole other set of considerations for how we would do that. Um, about what might inform what would be good enough, what would, where would we draw that line. And I'm not going to get into that. Um, but some things can affect this, like um, what, it, what can we expect out of you? Like what's the most work in terms of research that we could actually do? What's practical? What's feasible? Uh, what are we in a position to do? Um, can be one factor, but there can be others too. The kind of thing that we're talking about can affect it. Like I said before, maybe all it takes is one time putting my hand on that hot stove to have an adequate basis for making a generalization about how hot stoves can burn my hands. But when we're talking about something like sexual deviance, like the very complex human behaviors, might need more than one person. Right? That one person isn't a strong enough exemplar for all people. So we would have to get some more. 
Okay, so uh, that can factor from circumstance to circumstance. All you need to know for this class and for the exam is that what would make it stronger versus weaker is sample size. That's one factor that will affect the argument to be stronger or weaker. Certainly, more is better. At, at a certain point, there's diminishing returns here, of course, because the whole idea about sampling a reference class is that the, set, the reference class is probably too big to be able to look at each and every case. If we could just do that, then that's great. Then we could find out about the reference class directly without having to do a generalization. But in many cases, we can't look at every single case. So we'll do a generalization. Especially, um, like I've talked about, there's some connections here with science. When scientists posit uh, a law, um, then they, they are making a generalization based on observed cases. But the law is generalized over observed and unobserved cases, including like future cases, things that haven't happened yet. Um, but the laws still are supposed to apply to them. So if we, there's no way when it comes to understanding nature that we can investigate each and every instance of a causal happening or something in order to uh, figure out what's going on with it. So, and whether a certain law uh, accurately explains what's happening. So we're going to have to generalize at some point. All right, so that's the first standard. Sample size, pretty straightforward. Strong, uh, more samples, the, the stronger. Bigger sample size is better. Okay, now we're the the book sort of separates this into two sections: is the sample biased, and then is the result biased in some other way. I actually want to split these two into three, and the first one's going to be the same. Um, sample bias is one of them, but then the other two types of bias are going to be bias in interpretation and bias in investigation. That's how I'm going to talk about them, and I'm going to expect you to address all three versions of bias um, on the exam. You're going to have to evaluate the statistical generalization for all three different forms of bias. And this is this is something I have a particular axe to grind about because I find uh, lots and lots of instances of people throwing around the word bias um, without really acknowledging some of the things about what they're talking about, like they're misusing the word bias in a lot of cases. Uh, the first thing is that bias comes in a lot of different forms. And they're very different types of mistakes. So if you're able to prevent a certain form of bias in your reasoning, that doesn't mean you are immune to all forms of bias. Um, they don't all come in the same sort of way. They they all affect our judgment in different ways. And another thing, um, okay, so here, uh, get ready. A little little mini mini lecture rant from Tim. Uh, I hope it's not too painful. Uh, let, let's talk about bias a little bit before I get into these particular um, standards. So one thing I'm fond of saying is that um, if if I was a like let's say I'm a linguist who doesn't know English, um, so and I'm trying to un, I'm trying to understand it. So I'm trying to uh, figure out you know what what do humans mean by these words in English, right? So I'm kind of you know watching and observing people and trying to make judgments about this. And if I was only looking at their behavior as a way of trying to get a grasp on the meaning. Because there's a lot of like slang terms. It's like you, you can't really define it. You kind of just have to look at what people are doing with it to figure out what it's meaning. It's not based on the dictionary definitions, right? It could involve all sorts of idioms and idiosyncrasies to it. So if I was just looking at people's behavior with the word bias to figure out what people mean by bias, I might come to the conclusion that, what, um, that people use the word bias to describe someone who has a patterned thought process, they like recognize that there's a pattern to someone's thinking, and they don't like it. So we'll call it bias. But that's very inadequate as a definition of what we really have in mind when we're concerned about bias as something that interferes with rationality. Um, because patterned thinking is kind of what rationality is. Right? Okay, so we're trying to uh, hold our thoughts accountable to principles and standards for proper inferences, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that there's just a pattern going on, or that a person has uh, certain belief commitments that's part of what they're defending, that might just be part of normal, sincere, appropriate, rational behavior. Um, if we think there's something wrong with it, it's not necessarily going to happen just because it's patterned. But just that we don't like it is not enough to call it something like bias, which is a, a much deeper kind of accusation. 
we could we could debate a little bit here about how we should philosophically understand bias. One of my going uh, favorite definitions that I think captures the main oomph of it um, is this one: that bias would refer to is is an appropriate term to describe any sort of force that is irrational or irrational or arbitrary that interferes with our belief forming process. So it's it could be a psychological force, it could be a political or sociological force, is anything that interferes. It could, it could even be just, you know, hardwired biological like we've got some natural mistakes in reasoning that we make um, as human beings that are not necessarily the result of culture but are just kind of they seem to be almost hardwired into our into how our minds work, how our brains function. And it didn't necessarily have to be that way. Um, but, um, oh man, I'm a little tired today. Um, so, a irrational or irrational force that interferes with belief formation. That's, I think, what we're worried about with bias. When we're trying to figure out what we should sincerely believe, what is it appropriate to believe? What is actually true? We're trying to use reasons as a way to argue to a certain conclusion. We're looking at the evidence to decide the matter for us. That we're like, we, how am I, am I supposed to believe this or this? I can speculate all day long. But what are the arguments that would guide me to drawing a conclusion? Kind of like in the Code of Intellectual Conduct when we talked about um, the goal here is to try to figure out which belief or what position on an issue is the most rationally defendable. We want that to be, the in critical reasoning, we want that to be the process that determines what beliefs we have. I had told you before, remember at the beginning of this class, I'm like, this isn't something benign. Like, critical reasoning is, I called it an ethical paradigm, because there's other ways of deciding how, what we should believe. But in critical reasoning, the goal here is to have it happen on a rational basis, that we have rational justification and reason for believing what we believe. And that's how we want to decide what beliefs we're going to hold is based on what's supported with evidence and argument. So bias interferes with that because we have tendencies. We have psychological tendencies um, that interfere with our ability to be responsive to argument and to evidence, and that's what we, re we refer to as bias. Uh, it clouds our judgment. right? It um, distorts results from what, is, what they actually speak for. And that's the kind of thing that we could be concerned about. I think we all should be concerned about. Bias is not just something that some evil people have and the rest of us well-meaning citizens don't. We all have biases in all sorts of areas. And the other thing that I want to say about bias generally is that I do think that there are, like I said, there's different forms of bias. We're about to talk about three different ways in which this rational process can get hijacked. I, some of the forms are, I'd say, maybe, I don't know, I have a perfect word for this more um, innocent than others. Like a lot of times when we think about bias, we think about things like prejudice and bigotry. Again, I'm gonna, I wanna talk about those a little bit later. Um, but uh, but there's, there's some that are kind of just like, it's almost like making a math mistake. You know, like there's a certain tendencies that we have to like reason in, inappropriately about probability or something like that. They're not so um, insidious or, or having to do with injustice or something like that. Um, and that can definitely happen here with statistical generalization. Now, depending on some other context, it might become morally and ethically problematic. Um, but some of this stuff is just like bad reasoning habits that we have or that we picked up or that we sort of innately had. So I want to say that about bias before we get into this. And you'll see kind of um, how these uh, forms of bias could, how statistical generalization is uh, susceptible or vulnerable to particular forms of bias, and this could affect whether the statistical generalization is strong or weak. Whether the evidence that the statistical generalization is using to draw its conclusion adequately does defend that conclusion. Okay, so let's talk about this first one, uh, sample bias. And the major question here is this one. Is the sample not representative of the reference class? And if the answer to this question is Yes. Then we have to ask a second question before we can tell whether there's sample bias. Is the way in which the sample isn't representative relevant to the property in question? Okay, so if we're figuring this out, um, I'm actually going to, okay, let's move this around just slightly, make some more room. Okay. We're going to talk about standard number two. 
which is sample the prop the possibility of sample bias where again again where are we gonna have to look well we gotta look at the sample but we also have to think about the sample in um, with relevance toward yeah, uh, we have to look at this sample also with an eye to what is the reference class and what's up with property X. Both of these, all three of these things are going, we're going to have to compare against each other. It might be looking like I'm pointing arrows at everything. Um, and I kind of am, but <laughs> there's, a, there's a sequence here to how, how to think about it. So when we say, when we're asking the question, is the sample representative of the reference class? We're wondering, is there something going on with the sample class that's different from what's going on with the reference class? And that could, there could be that happening, uh, and that could be a problem, or it could not be a problem. So we have to ask the second question. If there is something happening with the sample that's different from the reference class, is that, is that kind of difference something that's relevant to whether or not something has property X or not? And I think I've got a good illustration here uh, of what I've got in mind uh, of, with, with sample bias. Like, what would be a case that would count as sample bias? Let's go back to polling. So we're trying to figure out what all Americans, the reference class, think about gun control. So their opinion about gun control, that's property X. We want to figure out what that is. And so to sample the, uh, to figure that out, to investigate that, we're going to sample some Americans. We're going to do a poll to figure out what they think. Um, and whatever they think, you know, that's what we'll generalize to all Americans. Okay. So let's say my sample... The, the Americans that I go talk, because they have to be Americans, the sample's got to be in the reference class. That's just mandatory for it to even count as a generalization, um, for it to even be in this category. But let's say the sample of uh, people I talk to to figure out about gun control are only members of the NRA. What if I only talk to members of the NRA? They count as Americans. They're in the category of Americans. But there's a problem here. Um, on, the, on just the face of it, just conceptually first, if we're asking, is the reference class, or is the sample representative of the reference class, uh, it, clear, it clearly is not, and, and there's a difference. There's a contrast here. We talked, the people that we talked to were all members of the NRA, the National Rifle Association. Not all Americans are members of the NRA, so that's just a difference. That doesn't automatically mean that there's bias, though, and this is what we have to, a lot of times when we're trying to identify bias, we only get that far. And there's a separate step of analysis that we have to go through before we're like, yep, there's bias going on there, or no, there isn't bias going on there. So the first question, though, is, is there some way in which the sample is not representative of the reference class? If there is, like in this example, there is. The next question is, is the way in which the sample is not representative of the reference class something that's relevant to determining whether or not something would have this property, the property in question. So in this case, we're asking, is the fact that someone is a member of the NRA versus not necessarily a member of the NRA, is that something that would be relevant to their opinions about gun control? To make this determination of relevance, you have to use your background assumptions about the world. You're going to have to think outside the box here. You're going to have to be like, you're, you're actually going to have to bring in all that outside knowledge you have, not just what the problem is going to give you. You have to think about it in the context of everything you know about the world. Would um, membership in the NRA, the National Rifle Association, maybe have something to do with what your opinions about gun control are going to be? Is there a link between those two things? I'd say so, yes. Yes, very much so. Definitely that there is that is going to affect. Whether you're a member of the NRA has an impact. It has some connection here with what are going to be your opinions about gun control. So in this case, I'd say huge sample bias. If you're trying to figure out what all Americans think and you only talk to members of the NRA, that's not, that's not a, the right way to conduct that poll or to make that generalization. You're going to have a weak generalization if you do that. You don't have as much reason to think that the entire reference class has that same property. This is what the book was talking about is all the different ways that polling can go wrong. Like when polls are trying to really be careful to make sure that they are uh, pulling from people that represent all the sorts of demographics in America that might have some sort of relevant connection with this. Uh, but let me give you an example of something that would be like maybe not representative but doesn't constitute sample bias. Let's, let's go back to the same case. This is 
this is, in case you were wondering, this is the joke I was promising earlier. I am proud of my jokes. I don't make a ton of them, so gotta take them where I can. I'm not that much of a comedian. But anyway, let's say uh, we're trying to figure out what all Americans think about gun control. And the people I talk to, they're Americans, but I only talk to people who love bananas. So that's my sample. I'm only talking to people who love bananas. And that's, that sample is not representative of the reference class because there are Americans who hate bananas. Not all Americans love bananas. But this isn't going to be sample bias because there really isn't a relevant connection between whether or not you like bananas and whether you what you think of gun control. The only thing that I can imagine maybe being a connection is that like, you know, banana kind of like looks like a gun. You can like hold a banana as a gun. But that's about it. I mean, that there and that's probably too thin of a connection to really worry us here. That oh, banana lovers are going to be well, I don't know what more disposed to liking guns. That, that doesn't really make sense. Okay. So there could be ways in which um, your poll is not uh, representative of on every respect with every variable of the reference class, but that may not be a problem for the argument. If it's not something that's relevant to whether or not something would have property X, it's not really going to constitute sample bias. So don't forget, when you're trying to determine sample bias, you have to ask both of these questions in looking at the argument um, to be able to determine what's happening. But this is really... Um, in fact, I'm actually going to, now that you've seen the arrows, I'm going to erase the arrows. Because um, the sample, the, the arrow is mostly on the sample class. Because sample bias happens in how we select the sample. So remember I, I said that there's, there's kind of like a process here that's involved with uh, statistical generalizations. And I wanted to use the example of this student who is doing this sociological study uh, to kind of walk you through it. I mean, if you're going to do that sociological study, the first thing that would need to happen is you're going to have to get some people. You have to find some people. And and how you do it, and it's not so much how you select those people as much as the people who are selected. Like the things that we're worried about in how we select the sample is really ultimately cashed out in terms of what is that sample that we're ending up with. And does that sam sample reflect or represent in all the relevant ways what's happening with the reference class? Okay, so... This would be kind of like um, maybe the student is like uh, asking people in the cafeteria to take a survey. So the people that say yes, that comprises the sample. And are those people um, represented in the proper way? And sometimes, you know, these studies try to control for that because when the person takes the study, you ask them about certain information, like identify your ethnicity, what is your gender, like all these sorts of things to try to get a sense, what's your age? Um, where do you live? What class, you know, uh, economic class would you fall under? What tax bracket? That kind of stuff. To try to work out those results and see, okay, well, we got these results from this demographic, but we have to think about whether that's representative across the board and how to handle those samples. So that would be all decision making that's happening at the level of deciding what's the sample that we're going to investigate. So the next two um, forms of bias we got to keep an eye out for are <clears throat> bias in interpretation and bias in investigation. And I think the best way to explain these, I, I'm a little dissatisfied with the book and how it describes these things. I, I kind of list this in my lecture notes. But I think the best way to describe it is by talking through this sort of process of what's happening here. So back, back to our example again. Um, once I've got a sample class selected, like let's say... Uh, this would be a really weird way to do that sociological study, but let's say I get a bunch of students who all agree to take the survey at a certain time in a certain uh, classroom on campus. So um, everyone sort of gets into the room, but I can't just like look at the people and see the truth of what's happening with them, especially with something like their behavior, their sexual behavior, and what are its features. So I have to find some way of investigating the sample. I have to gain perspective, or I have to find some way to observe the sample um, to be able to figure out what's happening with them. So I actually like to add into our little model here something that you know uh, wasn't in there before, this notion of data. And actually, uh, let's probably let's do it this way. I want to... <clears throat> kind of, well, no, let's not do it like that. Let's do it like 
this. I want to make a little gap here because data is something that goes in between um, my observations of the sample class and my determination that the sample has the the property in question. Okay, so the data is what I collect about the sample. It's my way of it's my observations about the sample. But sometimes there's a, a gap, there's a jump here from what the data says to the determination that there is uh, that the sample has that property. So that's where the next two forms of bias show up. So there's um, there's a potential bias here <clears throat> in how we collect our data, and that will be bias in uh, uh, observation. And then, <clears throat> pardon me. Then there's another um, opportunity in this whole process for bias that happens at the level of interpreting the leap from um, from the data to the determination that um, <clears throat> the sample has property X. So let's get these all into our diagram here. So standard number three is concerned about bias in investigation. Okay. And then number four is concerned about bias. Oh, why do I keep doing that? Bias in interpretation. And both of these forms of bias are really um, having to look at what we're doing with this collected data. So <clears throat> back to our example with the, with the sociology, uh, sociology study. The survey is the way of investigating what's happening with the sample. Um, and the survey has to has its own procedures for how to collect data. The data would be like the responses of the people who took the survey, what sort of answers they list. But like we were saying earlier, you know, if you're trying to study something like people's sexual behavior and whether it's deviant or not, you can't just ask them straight out about it. You're going to have to be a little clever. So the way that questions are worded would maybe be relevant for how the investigation is proceeding. Like, how are you trying to gain that window into what's going on with the sample? Uh, that could be going in a way that is likely to produce more um, accurate results and in ways that have probably like have some likelihood to distort the, the accuracy of the results. Okay, so uh, another example I like to do is uh, um, it comes from the classroom itself. So at the end of the class, you know, you take a, a student evaluation of the course and you're like, um, you know, what did you think of the teacher? Was it clear? How hard was the class? Um, all this sort of stuff. But how clear was the instructor? Were they well prepared? Blah, blah, blah. Now, if I just asked you those things, like, what do you think of my teaching? And I'm the one asking, then that's going to be bias and investigation because the way that I'm trying to figure out what's going on with you, the sample that I am making a, a generalization off of, uh, I'm probably less likely to get an honest, straight answer from you. We have a natural psychological tendency where we don't want, we want to be nice. You know, we don't want to tell someone to their face that, you know, I think you suck as an instructor or something like that. Or if we had something nice to say, then we'd be happy to share it. But if we don't have something nice to say, that's a little more uncomfortable and it might take some courage to do that. And some people might not be a problem. Other people, it might be a problem. So, um... There's some differences here, circumstance to circumstance, but we want to be on guard about it. We want to be careful about it. You can't just, even if you're cool with telling me what you think of my instructing to my face, you know, other people might not. And I have to take that seriously when I'm looking at these evaluations and how I want to go about doing them. How am I going to investigate what my students' opinions of the class are? If I ask them directly, it could be a problem. But look at how we do it in class. We let you uh, answer an anonymous survey where I look at, I get the results, I get to see what students um, had as their answers, but I don't know who they are. I don't know who said what. I don't know who made what judgment or filled out what bubble on the bubble sheet. You know, I don't know. I still get to see what's going on, and the hope is that that anonymity means that students will be more honest uh, in sharing their opinion, and that's what we need. We need the data that we collect to be actually accurate to what's going on with the sample class. So this is how I like to define bias and investigation. When you're looking for bias and investigation, 
you're looking for how is the data getting collected about the sample is there anything that is suspicious or of concern that we might be worried that the data that we end up collecting is not accurately reflecting the realities of what's happening with the sample that's bias and in investigation okay so that it's all about the data and whether the data whether we have cause to be worried that the data doesn't represent what's truly going on with the sample class and and this requires a, a bit of savviness you have to know like what are the factors that could influence people in this way like I have to have some background assumptions here about how people want to be nice to be concerned about the whole anonymity thing so so that's that's bias and investigation bias and interpretation is easy to confuse with this but it's really something different data I mean sometimes I, I like I think we have this tendency to think that statistics just speak for themselves or like the data the evidence that you collect just tells you what is going on and that isn't always the case um, in, in many cases we have to interpret the results uh, and we have to bring some other stuff to the table here to figure out like okay so they gave this response on the survey does that count as sexual deviance you know we had to ask the questions in a sneaky way so we could get honest responses but now that we've been sneaky about it, now we have to figure out, is that response to that question actually evidence that they fit in this category, they have this property or not? Okay, so that's always an issue here. Uh, or, or it's not always an issue, but sometimes it's a bigger issue, sometimes it's messy, sometimes it's not. If you're doing a poll for how people are going to vote in the election, it's just like check, check this candidate, check that candidate, write in your own check. There's not a lot of ambiguity here in the data. If the survey results are the data, there's not a lot of interpretation. Oh, they checked Democrat or they checked Republican, so we know what they're doing. Or they said yes to that initiative or no to that initiative. I don't have to be like, is that a check mark or no? I mean, they remember the hanging Chad thing from an uh, election many years ago. Uh, maybe you don't remember that whole scandal, but uh, there can be cases of ambiguity in it. But it's it's a little harder. It doesn't require as much interpretation to figure out whether someone filled in this bubble on the survey or not. Okay. But in other issues, like that's why I like this. Ooh. Oh, pardon me. That's why I like this sociological example. Most sociological studies require some degree of interpretation. Evidence doesn't always speak for itself, but we want to have the evidence, the data that we collect, actually guide us to our conclusion here. Otherwise, what's the point of doing the investigation? That's the issue around prejudice. But let's go back to this. So, um, so now I've got my data. I might have to do some interpretation to figure out if the sample, if the data is saying that the sample has this property or doesn't have this property. So I got to make a judgment call here. Now, um, when I'm making this judgment call, like I was saying a second ago, I may have to bring in some outside knowledge, some background assumptions. Okay, so this this is something that, that I was like worried about with the book in terms of how it talks about prejudice, prejudgment. There are some judgments that we bring in, that we import, that we have to do that with in order to see, to interpret the data, that's why it's bias and interpretation, interpret the data for what it's saying. It may not read right off the page. It's, it's kind of like, um, well, this is kind of a weirder case example, but I, I mean, it fits perfectly right. Um, take like a religious context, like a bunch of Christians talking about what God wants. And they might all be like, it's the Bible. The Bible tells you what God's all about, right? There's God telling you what's happening. But the Bible doesn't read right off the page. There's an incredible amount of theological dispute about how to understand what it's saying. No one maybe disputes that, yep, that's the verse at this chapter and verse, whatever thing, that's what it's saying. There can be some issues with interpretation and, or translation, so sometimes people dispute that. But, I mean, you've got the texts that settles it but it doesn't settle how we're interpreting the significance of what it's actually saying it's kinda like or another example would be like people um, looking at a poem and getting different meanings out of it there's there's room for interpretation even when it comes to evidence and that's sometimes like a dirty secret about evidence that's not really so dirty and not really such a secret but people can sometimes be surprised at that of like wait uh, there's not supposed to be any subjectivity here well in inductive reasoning there's no getting around it we always have to bring in our background knowledge of what we think is going on with the world generally to figure out what this counts as evidence for, what this particular ob observation means in terms of what we should conclude. Um, and that's, that's a fallible process, and it is very much dependent on what our background assumptions are. But there's kind of no other way for us to get around this. If you want to talk about 
with me sometimes if you want to ask about uh, whether like or if you're really concerned that that fallibility just like made for like huge problems and there are some philosophical concerns that are raised about this but I'd say let's talk about that another time if I get started talking about it I'm gonna talk for a whole nother hour and it's already been an hour and five minutes so I'm gonna not talk about that tangent right now but if you want to talk about it I would be happy to there's some really wonderful contemporary debates that have happened around this issue of induction and fallibility but this is what we have to work with and I encourage you to have confidence using your own background assumptions in when you give your answers as long as you're explaining them adequately I can tell that you know what bias and in interpretation or bias and in investigation or sample bias is really about even though it does require this kind of subjective judgment call where you use your background assumptions just tell me what are the background assumptions that are informing your judgment it's the same thing you had to do with Gricean um, in, uh, conversational implication and the linguistic analysis. When you're interpreting what the implied meaning is, background assumptions are relevant for how you conduct that interpretation. As long as you share that with me and I can see your thought process, I can give you credit for a lot of these problems. Um, you might be like, I've got some weird views about the world. My background assumptions, you know, not really standard or normal. And that's fine. As long as you're explaining your answers and showing me what are the background assumptions you're using, to arrive at your conclusion, things will be A-OK. -okay. But that's the difference here. So we've got how we collect data about the sample, that's bias and investigation, and then how we interpret the data, that's bias and interpretation. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I left out a, a big thing here. So this is all leading somewhere. Um, so on the one hand, we always have to use our background assumptions to interpret data for what it's significant. What is it? Is this evidence for this or for that? We always have to do that. But there's something called prejudice. There's a phenomenon called prejudice, and there and this could be connected with bigotry. And again, I'll talk about that in the next lecture about what I have to say about bigotry. And, but prejudice is not always like a form of bigotry. It, prejudice can also be used. To, we can mean that word to not be loaded with all that meaning, but just as a prejudgment that someone is coming to this situation with a judgment already in mind and then they're looking for evidence that actually backs it up. If you've ever heard of um, what's this called? Confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is when we is sort of an aspect of our psychology where we notice more easily and quickly those claim or that those ev the evidence that supports our pre-existing beliefs than the ones that challenge it. That we're actually that's a kind of a natural bias that many of us have and struggle with. It's very ordinary, still problematic, definitely common though. This happens um, most of the time because we're spending most of our efforts trying to justify our beliefs instead of using charity to understand where our opponents coming from, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the our radar is deployed to be sifting for evidence that reinforces what we already believe. Right? And this is something that scientists still have to struggle with too. I mean, they're trying to be objective. And this is still some, a trap that they can sometimes fall into. And it's a very well-documented tra uh, trap that um, there's been lots of studies about scientists, scientific studies about scientists and how they do science. And this is a pressing concern. It's always a problem. So we have to be careful about that. When you're evaluating the homework problems for bio... Oh, oh, all right. So what's the difference between prejudice and the use of background assumptions that we ordinarily have to use in order to interpret? Here's, a, here's the kind of metric that I prefer. If your background assumptions are enabling or empowering the evidence to guide your judgment to the conclusion, probably okay. If they are sort of interfering with the ability of the evidence to guide your conclusion, then there's a problem. Then that's prejudice. You're prejudging the situation. In which case it's like, why did you even collect the data? If you are already going to draw that conclusion anyway, no matter how the data showed up, then why even collect the data in the first place? The whole point, the whole logic behind statistical generalization is that I want to do an investigation. I want to investigate the sample to let that investigation determine what I should believe. Not that I'm just looking for some kind of statistic that rationalizes what I already suspected. Okay? That's the, the sincerity of it, is that we want to let the investigation guide it and guide our interpretation. Let the data determine what we should think. If the background assumptions that we're using to interpret the data, leave it impossible that any sort of data we could have collected would have caused us to make a different judgment, then there's def that's a smoking gun for prejudice right there. That's something you can watch out for. And again, you have to use your background assumptions, again, in another way, 
to for the concerns about what kind of bias and interpretation could happen. Confirmation bias is a big one. Conflict of interest is a kind of bias that can happen here. Um, let's say, uh, like, let kind of go back to the um, student evaluations. I mean, I, I have to, str I struggle with this when I'm reading the evaluations and I have to be like, okay, I know I have a natural tendency, like all human beings, that you want to look good. You want to be justified. You want to be legitimized. No one really likes, unless they have kept, kept very cult carefully cultivated their character, no one really enjoys getting criticism. They might value it, but it's hard to get your character into a position where you actually enjoy it. I've worked hard to try to do that, and I have to be modest in terms of what my successes are because, again, I might have a bias in overestimating my success about something that I want to do, and that's kind of part of the issue here. If I'm reading those student evaluations, I would much rather have them show me doing a good job than a bad job, and I might interpret what a student is responding as being like, yeah, that's pretty, they, they, can't, they liked it. There's not a problem here. Versus that. Oh, the student is trying to communicate. There was something that wasn't working for them. So that's where it's good to get some independent eyes on it. Get an interpretation from someone who you don't have, who does not have a conflict of interest going on in the situation. So then there's a there's a ton of other forms of bias that are out there, or forces of bias that is irrational, irrational forces that interfere with our ability to conduct these reasoning activities in the proper way. Um, there's a lot of things out there you can keep an eye out for and that you might um, that might help to inform your answers here. But here's one final tip. And this is true a little bit for bias and investigation, but a lot of it for bias and interpretation. There's ve it's very rare that you will find a smoking gun for this, especially in the homework exercises, which are very short and don't give you a lot of context or background of what's going on in the situation. In many cases, you're like, I don't know how they conducted the survey. Uh, maybe we'll um, we'll talk through some examples a little bit later, but you know, in another video, and I can kind of walk you through this. They don't give you a lot of background. So how would I want you to tackle these problems? I want you to, uh, even if you can't tell for sure that there was bias in investigation or bias in interpretation, you can uh, articulate to me what things you might be concerned about or suspicious of in the, the case that you're asked to evaluate and to analyze. So even if you can't confirm it, you can at least tell me what you might be worried about. And that would be enough to kind of demonstrate to me that I know, that you know, what this sort of bias consists in and how to not confuse it with the other forms of bias or the other standards for how we evaluate statistical generalizations. So again, and this is going to happen across the board with all the forms of induction that we're going to look at in these video lectures. Explanation is huge. You always want to be prepared to be able to explain your answer, to not just give what you think is the correct answer, but to explain your answer. It's going to be really important. So get practice with it now when you're doing the homework. Okay, I think that we're going to call it good here because this is about an hour and 15 minutes. It's a long video. So I'm going to cut it off here. Uh, when we come back, I might say some more things about bigotry, prejudice, and statistical generalizations and try to defend how they're not automatically offensive or problematic ethically but that the problem is coming from other places when we're talking about bigotry and prejudice and stereotypes. Um, so I'll make a little case for that. I'll try to keep that as short as I can. <laughs> um, but then we'll talk about statistical applications in the next video too. And I think I'm going to try to make each video for each form of inductive reasoning. We'll kind of kind of do it like that. But there's a lot of material here to cover. So um, this is one installment. There's many more to come. So I'll see you then. Bye.